So just to be clear, I have not read the Wheel of Time series, so I do not profess myself to be an expert. I've only just started reading Eye of the World slash listening to it on Audible, but I'm about halfway through the Eye of the World, and overall, I'm enjoying it. I think the Eye of the World is a good book, and I think that Wheel of Time has the potential to be a great show, but... Boy oh boy does the show just not represent the greatness of the book. Because I won't lie, I started to watch the show just because I'd heard all these YouTubers that I liked and enjoyed like Shadowversity, Daniel Green, Man Carrying Things, they were all hyped up the Wheel of Time, they were like the Wheel of Time is a great series of books, I've read these books since I was a child and I was like, okay cool, I trust these guys opinions, I like them, I'll go try out the Wheel of Time show. I watched those first three episodes and I was like, I, I don't get it. What am I missing? And so I went on Audible, used one of my credits, and got Eye of the World. And then I obviously bought the book because I like buying the, you know, physical copies of the books when I buy an audiobook. And yeah, I'm about halfway through the book and the book is just so much better. I hate to be that guy, but yes, the book is better. Especially when you do compare the book to those first three episodes because man, just... Those first three episodes is just useless setup. By the end of episode three, out of the main four characters, I didn't know much about them aside from Matt. But even then, Matt's only defining feature was that he was a smart mouth. And honestly, those first few episodes are really rushed, which is surprising. They're all 55 minutes long. You know, Game of Thrones was that length. See, one of Game of Thrones. I watch Game of Thrones and I feel like the showrunners have managed to cover a certain amount of grounds and I understand the world, the characters, and they're also telling a good chunk of the book within those 55 minutes. You watch Wheel of Time and I feel like they're rushing everything. The show doesn't create enough atmosphere about the world. What is the One Power? What are the Arjas? What are the Fades? Who is the Dark One? We get none of that. It's just them, you know, doing all the stuff from the books, but rushing through everything so they can fit everything into the season. Another problem I've got, and this is a minor one, is that they aged up the main four characters. In the books, they're roughly about 15, 16, 17, but in the show, they aged them up a bit, so they are definitively in their 20s, and just, I don't know, it doesn't work for me, because in the book, it's meant to be a coming-of-age tale, like these are, you know, young kids growing up into adults. And I think one of the problems with aging them up is that Rand and Egwene are sort of a couple in the show, until they aren't. And it's really weird, because in the book, Rand loves Egwene, he has a crush on her, he wants to be with her, but he isn't confident enough to tell her that. But in the show, it's like, they're together, until they're not. So, they have sex, but then they also try to do the thing from the book where Rand and Egwene, you know, they like each other, but they aren't really together, and it's really confusing. Especially since they are having sex, like, that just doesn't work for me. Especially since this is meant to be a sort of medieval fantasy setting, and so them openly just having sex is weird, because back in those days, you know, they believed in divine right, they believed in chastity and all that, and in the show, you don't really get that. And in a way, it takes away that sense of pureness, that purity that comes from Rand being a young kid who's in love and can't really express his love, and yet the show just makes him and Egwene have sex, and it's like, that, that, that doesn't work. It's the showrunners and the writers injecting modern sensibilities into a show where it doesn't fit. Also, the Rand, Perrin, and Egwene love triangle they forced into those last two episodes was hilarious. Like, I remember it was like episode three or four where Perrin and Egwene are on the run and like he hugs her and people are just like, oh no, they're setting up a love triangle. I was like, no, they're not. You know, that's just Perrin being the protective older brother, just being like, I'm gonna keep you safe, I'm gonna keep you warm. And then they literally do that in the penultimate episode where, you know, Parents just like, you can't talk to her like that. Why are you talking to her? I was like, oh my god, are they actually going here? That that is I laughed. I thought that was so stupid. I was like, what why why? Especially since, and this is a really dumb change, they gave Perrin a wife in the show, which honestly was pointless and didn't add to much because one, it felt like they didn't even love each other. Like, you know, he goes into the forge, he hugs and is like, I love you. I felt nothing behind those lines. Two, he kills her, and whilst he does feel tortured about it sometimes, by the end of the series, he just kind of doesn't care. And three, when they reveal to the audience that Perrin loves Egwene, it just feels really wrong and horrible. Like, it ultimately makes his relationship with his wife feel pointless and really wrong because it's like, it almost comes across like Perrin loved Egwene, but he couldn't, you know, go for Egwene because, you know, Rand was with her, but not really with her. So he instead settled for Lila and then he kills her. And it's just, it's a mess. It doesn't work. And it's just 
a really bad change. The show also changes who the point of view character is and they change it to Moraine, which in itself I think could be okay if, you know, they're adapting the larger scheme of things. Again, I don't know much about the Wheel of Time, you know, series, but if Moraine is essentially like the main character-ish, that, that's a fine change. But in terms of them adapting Eye of the World into season one, it's a very bad change. Because you read Eye of the World, and it's Ran's story. We see the world through Ran's eyes, we're going through the journey through Ran's eyes. You know, until about halfway through when they all split off or whatever. But for the most part, yes, this is Ran's story. And in the show, Ran does not feel like the main character of the series until you get to those last two episodes where they kind of just go, yep, Ran's the dragon. And honestly, Amazon's marketing campaign about the show of, oh, who is the dragon? completely backfired because there was no need to make it a mystery because the book doesn't make it a mystery. When you read Eye of the World, it's pretty obvious that Rand is the dragon. And they even went to the lengths of purposefully excluding the scene where Tam tells Rand that he isn't his son. It's honestly really laughable. Like, I remember getting to the penultimate episode and then they do that flashback and I was like, oh yeah, they did do that scene, didn't they? And then I went back and watched those first two episodes. And they didn't do that scene, they just completely and purposefully glossed over it to make the reveal of Rand as the dragon more shocking and impactful when it just doesn't work. Like that type of misdirection is really bad and really lazy because instead of the show writers either accepting that people are going to figure out Rand as the dragon straight away and running with it, or instead making it a bigger and more smarter mystery, they straight up and purposefully removed a key scene from the book just so they could have their big surprise moment. Like, that is... That is bad writing. And honestly, one of the things that frustrates me about the show is that they just waste so much time on pointless events. Like, I understand you can't put everything in Eye of the World into the show. I understand that. I understand them cutting out the whole sequence where they go to the Stag and Liar Tavern, and then they do the whole sequence where Tom is like, kids, you know, don't tell anyone who you are, don't tell them that you're going to the White Tower and all that. I understand them cutting things like that out and having them just go straight to Shadar Logoth. Like, that's fine. I don't mind that. And of course, when you actually do read Eye of the World, you realise that the first, like, 20 chapters is just them in the two rivers, and there's all this talk about the two rivers, and they're setting up the community, and it's all world-building atmosphere. I understand you have to cut that short. That's fine. But just when you're two episodes into the show, and you spend a whole episode in the two rivers, and you don't really feel a much more personal connection to that place, like you do in the books, because in the books, it feels lived in. Whereas in the show, it just feels like a generic fantasy village. And that's the problem. The show just has a lack of atmosphere, especially the opening scene with Rand, because in the show, they do the bit where Rand and Tam are walking down with the car across the road. That's fine. But they also cut out the atmosphere and the mystery to when Rand turns around and he sees a fade walking down the road, he looks back and it disappears. That sense of atmosphere and mystery is what the show needed. That's what the show doesn't have. And the way they introduce the fade is so weird too. Like it cuts to this shot in the dead of night where no one is out and about in the two rivers. And the fade just walks into the center of the town and just like stares around. And it's awkward and weird because then it cuts to a scene and it's the next morning and that's it. Like, it's a weird establishing shot. Like, the more appropriate way to do that type of thing is to have the Fade on the top of a cliff, you know, looking down at the two rivers. That just makes more sense than having the Fade walk into the middle of the town and then just disappearing next day. That doesn't work. But to me, the most egregious scenario of time wasting is everything that happens at the Taran Ferry and with the ferryman. Like, it is so laughably bad. Like, there's just so much wrong with that scene. Like, the show just spends, like, 10 minutes of wasted time with this ferryman going, Ah, my son's over there with the Trollocs. Ah, my family. But my son. What? No, no, my family. There's no going back now, master. My son is on his way already. He'll be there in a moment. You have to help me. We can't leave him. And it's like... Why are we doing this? Why do we care? In the book, they cross the Taran Ferry, Moraine sinks the ferry, and the ferryman's just like, huh? What happened to my ferry? And they move on. But no, the show has to have the ferryman be all like, but my son! And then have him jump into the water whilst the ferry is sinking, making Moraine look like a murderer, which was just such a bad choice. Like, that is such a weird change for them to do. It's pointless as well, because not only does it make Moraine look really unsympathetic, but also it just makes the ferryman look like an idiot. But my son! You monster! Certain flashbacks that also open certain episodes, I also feel like are pointless and unnecessary and a waste of time. Like, I don't need to see like a 10 minute backstory on Suwan because one, Suwan is only in one episode, and two, 
I don't care. I haven't met this character yet. And three, it doesn't do anything with the present day story, so why am I watching this? And we also get a flashback in the last episode of the season with Luz Theron, but they don't adapt the prologue of I of the World, which is where Luz Theron, you know, kills his entire family but thinks they're still alive because he's gone crazy. And then the Dark One, you know, appears and he's all just like, oh wait, no, I did kill my family, what the hell? And he goes crazy. They don't adapt that and show us that cool prologue. No, it's just him talking to, like, his wife and his child, and he's like, oh, blah, 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 the dragon reborn, blah, blah, blah. And then it goes out the window, and it shows us that the Wheel of Time universe, before the new turning of the wheel, was very futuristic and sci-fi-ish, like, it looked kind of like Wakanda. And then the wheel turned, things happened, it's almost post-apocalyptic, and now the setting we get at the beginning of the show is this sort of medieval fantasy, showing that the world had regressed from that previous turning of the wheel. And speaking of prologues, the prologue that we get at the beginning of the show is kind of pointless and boring. It's just Rosamund Pike's Moraine narrating going, oh, there was once a dragon, a ch male channel is so powerful he could either make or break the world, and the last one did break the world. And meanwhile, all we're just seeing is Moraine suiting up and leaving the White Tower with Lan. Like, I'm sorry, that's boring. There was no sense of atmosphere, there was no sense of adventure or a looming threat, it's just Rosamund Pike getting ready to leave. <sighs> Honestly, it baffles me how people have managed to misinterpret why the prologue of The Fellowship of the Ring works so well in the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings trilogy. I mean, one, not only do you have a kick-ass actor in Cate Blanchett narrating as Galadriel, Two, you get an awesome, poetic, atmospheric opening monologue. You know, the whole, the world is changing. I feel it in the water. I feel it in the air. But also, as you get this great actor delivering this great poetic dialogue, you show us visuals. You know, in Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring, we get the march on Mount Doom. We get the big battle. We get clips of Sauron forging the One Ring and the dwarves and the elves. It seems like every other thing that tries to copy the Lord of the Rings prologue just doesn't get why it works. And the worst thing is, they have Rosamund Pike delivering this dialogue. She is fantastic. She is amazing. Imagine putting these great clips of of this dragon that makes or breaks the world. Put that over top of that, not just Rosamund Pike putting on her cloak and sheathing her dagger. That's not the right time to be doing a suit-up scene. Like, who made this? And the problem isn't just the writing, it's also the visuals. The filmmaking in this show is bad, particularly the cinematography. The way I describe the cinematography is that it's unfocused. The camera movement is always moving regardless of what the scene is, and it's really jarring, like, there are so many times where, like, it's Perrin and Egwene just, like, you know, s you know, sitting still, and the camera's just, like, someone stuck it on a gimbal, and they just, like, kept moving it around them, and it was just like, keep the camera still, we don't need it to be moving 24-7. Not to mention the visual style of the show is really ugly, like, the colour grading is not that great, and it also just makes all the shots look really overexposed, and the highlights are all blown out, and it's like, who colour graded this? How much money did Amazon put into this? Because apparently they put in a lot of money. I couldn't tell from the production values because the cinematography is not good. And the framing at times got really irritating for me. Like, for example, there's the scene with the brother and sister in the finale and they're talking. And instead of them being perfectly in centre of the shot, they're like this, they're like slightly off centre. And it's really irritating to me. Like, figure out in the blocking a way to get the two characters to move a couple of more inches so they are in the centre of the frame. Like, that sort of unrefined camera work was really irritating and really noticeable and made the show look cheap. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I think the last two episodes of the season were the ones I enjoyed the most, but that's mainly because they actually focused on Rand as the main character. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of dumb and stupid things in them, like, you know, Rand's mother, the Aiel, fighting while she is in the middle of labour. Like, that was so dumb and stupid. I'm all for women warriors, women being badass, women being cool, that's fine. But having her fight a bunch of men and soldiers in plate armor, by the way, that was infuriating. Like how her daggers were just going straight through plate armor. But her doing all of that while she was in the midst of labor, like if she was pregnant, I would be like, that's unrealistic. That's kind of dumb, but I would forgive it a little bit. But the fact that she is in the middle of labor, kills all these men and then immediately gives birth. That was stupid. That to me was a massive gaping logic hole. And I was like, that is dumb. That, that just broke all sense of reality. Like, I know this is a fantasy, but fantasies need reality to ground itself to make the things that we're watching believable. The show lost that for me as soon as they had her give birth immediately afterwards. But regardless of that, I still enjoyed them, but that's mainly because they allowed Yosha Stradowski to actually shine as Rand. Like, watching those episodes, I was like, yeah, 
He's a good actor. He's a good likable lead. I think if he was given the right material, he would make a great Randall Thorne. Like, I really like the scene in the ways where he channels for the first time. Like, albeit it goes against the lore of the Wheel of Time because in the books, the one power, there are two sides to it. There's the male side and the female side. And because Rand is a male channeler, no female should see his, you know, channeling. But Gwen's like, ah, I didn't mean to channel. That was an accident. So there is that problem. And it's weird because I liked it in the moment. Like when Gwen was like, oh, that was me who channeled. I didn't mean to. I was like, I thought that was Rand who did that, huh? And then later in the episode, they flash back to it and Rand was the one that channeled. I thought that was cool. I was like, oh, so I was right. That's, that's cool. I liked that. And I also did really like the moment where they revealed that Rand was the Dragon Reborn. Yasha Shradowski plays that scene really well. I, it finally kind of felt like Rand was coming into his own. And then you get to the finale and it's that generic, oh, Rand, you're trapped in this dream world. You know, you can have everything you want just so long as you allow the Dark One to come and seduce you. And then Rand having this MacGuffin that makes him defeat the Dark One really easily was just stupid and cheap and just... The finale doesn't work, but I still enjoyed it just because it felt like, you know, we were achieving something. I mean, yes, it was too easy, it was very anticlimactic, and there are a lot of dumb things in it, but I did enjoy it. And speaking of dumb things, the moment where Rand and Moraine walk into the Blights, and then Moraine's like, don't touch anything, yet the whole episode we see them, you know, sleeping in the Blight, leaning up against trees and logs that are covered in Blight, like... That was so stupid. Don't tell your audience one thing and then contradict them by doing that thing. The Battle of Faldara was also pretty poor. I mean, there was just wonky CGI. The battle tactics were dumb. Like, why were all the female channelers outside of the city when all the men, the foot soldiers, were at the pass, you know, way ahead of them, getting killed by Trollocs and Fades? Like, that's dumb. You know, bring the female channelers to the pass so you don't end up just killing a bunch of men for no reason. In many ways, I got flashbacks to the long night just of how dumb the battle tactics were and just... Yeah, it was bad. Oh, and Egwene bringing Nynaeve back to life was stupid and it was just... What's going on here? So Egwene can cure people from death or something? Like... What? But yeah, aside from I'd say like maybe the first two episodes and the last two episodes, the rest of the episodes in the show were quite boring. And I honestly think the biggest flaw of Amazon's Wheel of Time is that it tried to live up to the expectation that this was going to be the next Game of Thrones. The problem with these upcoming fantasy shows like The Wheel of Time, like The Witcher, is that they all are trying to fill this void of being the next Game of Thrones without actually understanding what made Game of Thrones work. I.e. they're trying to be the next Game of Thrones by turning the source material they're based on to fit the Game of Thrones mold, when realistically Game of Thrones was just being a good adaptation of the books they were based on. When you look at Game of Thrones when that show was at its best, mainly those first four seasons, those first four seasons were more or less just trying to be good adaptations of the books they were based on. Of course they made changes, but the changes they made made more logical sense. It was either stretching out character arcs so that they could satisfy the viewers within the season. So, you know, for example, in season four, Jon Snow's story arc in A Storm of Swords was not completed in season three. So they had to stretch out the Battle of Castle Black and make that the big climax of season four. So logically, they gave Jon a little mini arc in the middle to where Jon went to Craster's Keep to kill the mutineers. That is a logical character change, and if anything, when I actually read the Game of Thrones books and found out that that arc wasn't in the books, I was like, oh, that's weird because that felt like a very fitting George R. R. Martin side quest to do. So finding out that that wasn't in A Storm of Swords, I was like, wow, the show made a pretty good adaptation change. That's great. But things like The Wheel of Time don't try to do this. Instead, they take their source material and try to up up the ante and make it fit into that Game of Thrones mold. There's more violence, there's more sex. And that just doesn't work because the tone they're establishing, the Game of Thrones tone, doesn't work for the Wheel of Time material. To me, the tone of the Wheel of Time, at least from what I can gather from the amount of material I've read, is that it feels very much in vain of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, in terms of it's dark and there's a grit to it, but also it's quite pure and kind of sexless. Like, yes, characters will kiss and there's implied sex and all that, but it's not explicit. There is no moment where, you know, uh, Robert Jordan has like, oh, Rand walked in on Egwene and her tits were out and they were nice and supple. None of that. That's not what's in the Wheel of Time books. It's just very pure and almost like kid fantasy. The tone of the Wheel of Time should be very much Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings trilogy. 
Like, have a bit of grit, have a bit of darkness, but at the end of the day, this is meant to be something that all ages can enjoy. Like, I'm gonna be honest, I would not feel comfortable having a child sit down and watch the Wheel of Time show because there's too much gore and blood, and it's not a very pleasant watch for someone of that age. Like, Lord of the Rings is scary, but kids can sit down and watch it. Yes, they'll be grossed up by the gore, but at the end of the day, there is a lot of humour and fun, and overall, the Lord of the Rings is a satisfying watch for all. The Wheel of Time and all these other fantasy shows aren't like that. These other shows that I've mentioned, they aren't as well crafted as, say, Game of Thrones. Like, when you watch Game of Thrones, the battles, the cinematography, there is a craft, there is a care, everything is well constructed and composed. There is a simplicity to the cinematography, and in many ways they were trying to push the boundaries of what could be done on television. They tried to make television more cinematic. You look at things like The Wheel of Time and The Witcher, they try to look more mature and stylistic by adding in this gritty colour grading that's somewhat stylized. but at the end of the day, there is not a simplicity and a style to their cinematography. Like, you look at the production value of The Wheel of Time or The Witcher, it all just pales in comparison to Game of Thrones, like, nothing in these shows looks as good as this. Or this. Or this. <laughs> Or this. And honestly, seeing the current trend of these upcoming fantasy shows, I am terrified for Amazon's The Lord of the Rings. Particularly with what they've done with The Wheel of Time. Oh boy, I am shaking, I am panicking, I might even be sick. You go to your death, and the death of us all! Curse you! Curse you! And all the place! <laughs> Now, let's stop being a negative Nancy and get onto some of the things I did like about Amazon's The Wheel of Time. There aren't many, but there are things I did like. Rosamund Pike as Moraine is fantastic. I think she is so great. She's such a wonderful actor and she embodies this role so much. Like, to me, she is Moraine. I mean, it also helps with the fact that the audiobook I'm listening to of Eye of the World is narrated by Rosamund Pike. So, in many ways, yeah, it helps to add to the idea that she is that character from the book. But to me, she has that wonderful balance of being that caring mother figure, that sort of sneaky Dumbledore-like figure where there's plans within plans, but she doesn't want to reveal them. She's a kick-ass mage, she's wonderful, she's beautiful. Rosamund Pike is awesome as this character. You know, really theatrical, kind of like Kate Blanchett as Galadriel. She's awesome. Yostra Stradowski as Rand, I also really did like. In many ways, if he was given better material and a better show, he would have been a great Randall Thor. But for what he's given, he does the best with what he is given, which isn't much. And I am looking forward to seeing him progress in future seasons to see if they fix the Rand character and make him more, you know, impactful and imposing and the hero of the story. Daniel Henny as Lan, I did like throughout most of the show. Up until they get to the White Tower and there's that whole subplot with the other wars where he kills himself and Lan's like, you know, really like torn up about it. And then they get to the funeral scene where, like, they break, you know, Lan's stoic character and just has him, like, break down and cry and scream and start, like, pulling at his nipples. Like, that's when the show went way too far at trying to, you know, subvert the masculine stereotypes, you know, show some humanity to Lan. Like, I'm all for male characters crying and showing emotion and all that. I love that kind of stuff. But the way the show does it just makes it so over the top and makes the character of Lan come across as out of character. And also the screaming and the nipple pulling just ruins the scene. Like, if anything, the scene itself was working quite wonderfully where like, you know, Daniel Henney is performing the scene. He's really sad. There are tears in his eyes, but you know, he's, he's keeping a straight face. He's trying not to let the emotion break through. And then it cuts to Rosamund Pike's Moraine and she's tearing up. She's crying. It's all across her face. And I think it's wonderful because the show does a great job of showing the link between the Aes Sedai and the Warder. And so for me, the scene was playing, it was working, it was very impactful and emotional. I could feel Lan's emotion through Moraine. You know, all the Aes Sedai and the Warders, they're all like pounding their chest and there's this really awesome drum beat. And imagine that, you know, Lan's looking sad as that, you know, fades out into black. That would have been amazing. But no, we get nipple pulling and screaming and just it ruined it. I also liked Barney Harris as Matt up until they ruined his character because Barney Harris left production of the show. He left midway through production so they didn't film all the scenes they needed to with him and so they had to sort of edit around the footage and honestly they did the best with what they could and I don't envy the editor at all. Like the scene where they're at you know the portal for the eye of the world or whatever and then you know Ran, Moraine, Lan, Nynaeve, Perrin they all walk through the doorway and they turn around and Matt's just standing there. The 
door closes behind them. That was so bizarre to me. Like, if anything, when the scene was playing and Matt was all like, do we have to go? Like, can we turn back now? I thought he was joking. And then you actually watch the scene and he doesn't go through the portal because Barney Harris wasn't with them, you know, when they shot the scenes. It's so awkward and bad. Like, they're all just like, Matt! Matt, come, come, Matt, wait, wait for Matt, Matt, come in. It didn't work. It just, oh, I feel so bad for the people making that because that's, like, that seemed like such a nightmare scenario. But just, yeah, in terms of the storytelling, it doesn't work. And then also because they can film more scenes with Barney Harris, it seems like they turned Matt's character evil for no reason because they couldn't actually fulfill his arc for the rest of the season. So they're like, oh yeah, he shows up back at the White Tower and he's got this black cloak and he looks all possessed and evil. Ugh comes out of nowhere and it doesn't work again it's a horrible situation but in terms of the storytelling it just doesn't work i also like zoe robbins as naive i thought she portrayed the character really well she was strong she was fierce but she was also kind of gentle at times like yeah i, I liked her as naive though i will say with naive the thing that i just found funny was when you know she gets involved in the ran perrin Egwene love triangle thing she's just like stop fighting over her she's not some prize for you to be what like that was dumb. Also, her romance with Lan isn't that great. Like, when Lan actually full on, like, accepts his feelings for her, he's all like, you are as beautiful as the sun. You are got, like, cliche, corny, didn't like it. Uh, I also like the costuming. I thought the costumes were cool. I liked Moraine's outfit, like Lan's outfit. I also loved Ran's outfit, like his blue tunic and like the braces and, you know, the sheepskin coat he's got, the, like, with like the leather on it. That was cool. That was awesome. Though, I'm not a fan of the design of the Heronmark sword because it's just a katana. Like, the Heronmark sword is described to be this really badass sword, and the prop department in the show just seemed like they went, katana. But yeah, the actual production design itself, like the design work and all that stuff, the costuming, that's cool. I liked that. That looked really good. And the opening theme song to the show is alright. Like, again, unlike Game of Thrones, unlike Lord of the Rings, unlike The Witcher, there isn't a bunch of melodies set for specific things, so you don't actually, you know, have a memory of the scenes. Like, there is no musical theme that is connected to Rand. The only real musical theme we get is the opening theme song, which is fine. Ah. Like, yeah, that I like. I think that's cool. Lorne Balf did a good job with scoring that. And I won't lie, I am disappointed by the score since it is Lorne Balf. Like, he did the score for Mission Impossible Fallout. And that's a great score. And seeing the work he did with The Wheel of Time just... It wasn't satisfying at all. It was very disappointing, actually. Uh, the guy who played Tom Marilyn was good. I wasn't a massive fan of the portrayal of the character because he doesn't resemble his book counterpart, who's much more of a entertainer, a showman. He's meant to be sort of like Dandelion meets Aragorn. And in the show, I got the sort of Aragorn grungy ranger vibe. I got that. But I didn't get the dandelion, you know, Yaskia showmanship that he's supposed to have too. But, uh, yeah, that was it. I think that that's pretty much all I liked about The Wheel of Time. Like, yeah, I'm not gonna lie and pretend that I loved the show. I didn't. I thought the show was pretty bad. It's again one of those cases where they really should have just stuck to the source material because, again, when you're basing a show that's based on a series of books, it makes more sense just to adapt the books they're based on. Like, Game of Thrones did it, and Game of Thrones worked really well. So the same thing should apply to Wheel of Time, no? Like, I don't understand the writer and the showrunner changing it to make it fit into the 21st century and appealing to modern politics. No, just tell the story. There's a reason why these books are beloved. Like, sure, you can, you know, change things and make things more different. Like, I'm fine with Moraine being in a relationship with Sawan because, I mean, I'm not attached to these books. I'm not attached to these characters. Sure, if you want to do that change, that's fine. But doing things like giving Perrin a wife and, you know, giving the love triangle between Rand and Egwene, like, just, it's silly and stupid, and it's one of the reasons why the show, I personally think, fails as an adaptation. I also don't know what statistics Amazon are going off to say that Wheel of Time is one of their best original shows, because, I mean, I'm hearing nobody talk about this show. Everyone in my friend circles and in real life, no one talks about the Wheel of Time, so I don't know where they're getting this thing of, this is Amazon's number one show. I don't know where they're getting that from because, I mean, it isn't. The boys and Invincible are far superior than this show. But yeah, to end the video, this show was really disappointing. I was expecting a really exciting fantasy adventure 
Instead, I kind of just got a boring show that isn't as good as the book counterpart. And the worst thing is, I think it had potential. The cast is really good. The production design, the costuming, it's really good. It's let down by the cinematography, for sure, but there was potential here. This could have been a great show. And you know, I'll probably continue watching it, maybe, just to see how bad it does get, because I mean, season one did have some really bad spots. But yeah, what did you guys think of The Wheel of Time? Are you with me? Did you not like it that much? Or are you in the complete opposite boat where actually you love the show? Let me know in the comments down below. Like, subscribe, follow me on social media, all that good stuff. It's all down in the description. Until we meet again, see you guys next time.